Judd said it was going to end in a high, but I didn't know it was going to be that high. Hear these words from Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. And now we read the word of God. Let's talk to the God who wrote the word and ask him to help us understand it and be transformed by it. Father, we love you. And Lord, I'm asking that you would speak to us through your word today. Lord, you would stop anything that would be a hindrance, um, that you would not allow anything to come out of my mouth that would be a stoppage to anyone being transformed by the power of your word. Lord, your people do not need to hear from a young man. They need to hear from an eternal God. And so, Lord, I ask that you would do that. Do what your word has promised. Cut deep to bone and marrow and transform us by your great power. In Jesus' name and by the Spirit, amen. Hey, good morning. How is everybody today? Good. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be working through verses 24 through 29 this morning. So I thought Trace Jones just did a phenomenal job last week. Y'all, no, y'all, stop. No, don't give him that. No, he's going to be insufferable tomorrow if you give him that. Don't give him that. No. But he did a fantastic job uh, really getting into what it looks like for us to pursue, what it looks like to press in and really chase this call that God has given to us in unity for the sake of Christ and his church. And it got me thinking about this old preacher story that I heard a long time ago. Uh, There's this uh, grandfather, he's out in the country with his grandson. They're sitting on the porch and they've got uh, about 10 dogs underneath that porch, when all of a sudden, one of those dogs, ears perk up, sees something, and he starts tearing out across the field after something that he saw. Well, as dogs tend to do, all the other nine dogs, they get up, and they start barking and chasing out after that first dog who who went out first. And so the grandfather, he looks at his grandson, and he said, grandson, let me tell you what's about to happen here. In about 10 minutes, Nine of those dogs are gonna come back with their heads down, their tail between their legs, and their tongues out. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna get back up onto the porch and they're gonna go sleep. But there's gonna be that first dog that you saw taken off. It's gonna be about an hour or so. And he's gonna come back with a rabbit in his mouth. He goes on to explain to his grandson that he's not gonna get that rabbit because he's the best dog we got. He's not gonna get that rabbit because he's our best hunting dog. He's gonna actually get that rabbit. The first dog's gonna get that rabbit because he's the only one who actually saw the rabbit. All them other dogs are running and barking because when other dogs run and bark, they're gonna run and bark too. But because that first dog actually saw the rabbit, he actually saw it with his own eyes, that's gonna give him the endurance. It's gonna give him the determination to keep going even when all the other dogs give up. And I tell you that story to tell you this. What I want for you this morning, what I want for you more than anything this morning is to see the rabbit for yourself. For as long as God gives me the ability to speak, as long as God gives me the ability to pastor you, More than anything, I want you to see the rabbit for yourself. And here's why. Because like that grandpa told his grandson in that story, it's only when you see the rabbit with your own eyes that you're gonna have the endurance. You're gonna have the determination to keep going even when life gets hard. 
You'll keep going. You'll keep pressing in. You'll keep pursuing, not because everybody else is doing it, but because you've seen the rabbit with your own eyes. Y'all, there's a rabbit in these verses that we just read in the book of Colossians. It's, it, it changes everything when you see it. It's what's gonna keep you going. It's what's gonna give you that endurance, that determination to press on even when life gets hard. And, and here's what it is. It's understanding that in the deep parts of your being, Jesus Christ, God himself, the, the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15, he lives in you. He lives in you. It's understanding that somewhere in your chest cavity region, the God who created all things, the God who sustains all things, the God who holds all things together has decided to set up shop right here. You see, because when you understand that, I'm telling you, that's what's gonna keep you going. That's what's gonna give you not just the, the strength to, to just keep going, but it's gonna give you the endurance. It's gonna give you the determination. And, and here's the thing, with joy, even when life gets hard, even in the midst of suffering, I mean, look at how Paul starts off this section in verse 24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now, we read that, and that's kind of a strange phrase. I rejoice in my suffering. I mean, am I the only one who thinks that's kind of a strange phrase, a strange phrase there? I mean, what he's saying is that I rejoice in my suffering. He doesn't say I'm enduring through my sufferings. He's not saying I'm trying to get through my sufferings. He says I rejoice in my sufferings. Now, if we're gonna ask hard questions of the text, which is what we should be doing, by the way, we should be asking hard questions of the text. We should probably ask of this little phrase of scripture that we just read, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, how can you say that you rejoice in your sufferings? How can you say that and actually mean that? How can you have joy in your sufferings? And for, for people he's never met, Remember what Trace told us last week? Paul has never met these people at the church in Colossae. He has never met these people, and yet he's saying he's rejoicing in his sufferings for their sake. What he's also doing in his little situation is he's found himself in prison, and he's waiting to stand trial before a sadistic, unhinged, bloodthirsty Roman emperor named Nero. That's what he's dealing with right now. So how can he say, I rejoice in my sufferings? It's because he's seen the rabbit. It's because he knows that Jesus Christ, God himself, lives inside of him. That's what allows him to say, I rejoice in my sufferings. And I'm telling you, that's what's going to allow you to say it too. You wanna have joy in the midst of your suffering. You wanna have determination. You wanna have endurance to keep going even when life gets hard. It's about seeing the rabbit. It's about knowing that as a Christian, God himself is in you. Because here's what's gonna happen when you do. This is point one if you're taking notes. You'll start to live like Jesus is actually coming back and eternity is real you'll start to live like Jesus is actually coming back and, and eternity is real. So look back at verse 24. This is verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So if you underline things in your Bible, underline that, underline Christ's afflictions, we're gonna come back to that. For the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known among the Gentiles the riches of this glory of mystery, which is Christ in you. There it is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you're like, all right, Mr. Preacher Man, like, we read that, and how in the world did you get the return of Christ and eternity from that? And I love that you're asking good questions this morning. 
I feel like we're really on the same page. So, so let me, let me kind of get into this. Look back at verse 24 when Paul says, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. So I, I need to teach a little bit to unpack this. Uh, what Paul has in mind here when he's saying, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, that's a reference to ancient Jewish apocalyptic literature. And now, I know when I say that phrase, ancient Jewish apocalyptic literature, you get a sudden urge to check Instagram, but just dial in, stay with me. This is, this is really, this is good stuff. Uh, there, there was like 400 years between when the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, was written and the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, was written. And, and in that 400 years, there was a lot being written that was building on the teachings of the Old Testament. Uh, and it basically all had the same thing. So the theme was that everything's gonna keep getting bad, everything's gonna keep getting worse until the Messiah comes back, saves the day, and makes all things new. So more war, more disease, more violence, more bad things until the Messiah comes back and he makes all things new and he saves the day. So this afternoon, if you are sitting in your chair in your living room and you just get tired of watching Wimbledon, you're like, oh, I can't take this tennis stuff for a fortnight, just two weeks of this stuff, I can't take this anymore, I'm done. And you're just sitting in there in your chair and you get the sudden urge to read some ancient Jewish apocalyptic literature, what you would find if if you read a book like First Enoch, is that they actually believed that there was a set amount of suffering that God was going to allow until the Messiah came and, and he restored all things and he, he made all things new. Almost, if you would, kind of like a, a cup of suffering to where there's these drops in the bucket of this cup and it would fill and fill and fill and fill until the, it was kind of overflowed and the Messiah would come back and he made all things new. Now, fast forward to the New Testament, and a lot of the writers of the New Testament, they take that concept and they keep going with it. We, we don't really have time to get into all the passages, but you see it, see it show up in Mark 13, 20, you see it in Galatians 4, 4, you see it in Revelation 6, 10, and it's this concept that there's gonna be suffering, there's going to be hardship, there's gonna be bad things, and God's going to allow a certain amount of it until the Messiah returns and makes all things new. Now, Paul knows, though, that the Messiah has already come, right? Yeah, he knows that Jesus has come, he's lived, he's died, he's resurrected, he's ascended back into heaven. He knows the Messiah has already come once, so what's he talking about here when he's talking about the afflictions of Christ? He's talking about the second coming. What he's talking about here is that as a people of God, we're, we're living in between these two comings, these two uh, moments of, of Christ's uh, first coming and his second coming, where 2,000-ish years ago, Jesus came for the first time, and he began to reconcile to himself us, but also he began to reconcile himself to the world and the second coming of Christ when he's going to finish the job. And so that's why if you look in verse 25, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. What he's saying is that Jesus living inside of you, that's like the collateral for his second coming. What he's saying is the reason that we can be confident that Jesus is coming, the reason we can be confident in glory is because Jesus himself has put the best part of glory inside of us as a guarantee that he's coming back. So that's how we can have the hope of glory. Let me, let me see if I can explain it like this. Um, here's what it looks like to, to live like Jesus is actually coming back and eternity is real. Toward the end of World War II, um, when the German Air Force was weakening, the Allied bombers would go deeper and deeper into Nazi territory and they would go on these just massive bombing campaigns, just bombs and bombs and bombs, tons of them. But interestingly, they would also bring these leaflets. And here's a picture of what the leaflets look like. And these leaflets, they would have pictures and, and writings and English and German and French to let the people know that the Allies were rapidly advancing and war was coming to a very, very quick end. Now, because these were leaflets, they were just little pieces of paper. They would be dropped from the sky and you know, they would end up all over the place because they're leaflets and that's just kind of what paper leaflets do. Now, we know from history that they fell all over Europe. 
But what's interesting is we know that they also fell into prisoner of war and concentration camps. Now, if you could just kind of imagine with me for a second what that scene might have looked like in one of those camps. You got a prison guard who's walking around. He's got his machine gun slung over his neck. He picks up one of these pamphlets here, these leaflets that fell from the ground. Yeah, okay, yeah, let him try. Let him come get us. Okay, yeah, good try. Uh Uh-huh, come on, let's go. Not knowing what we know, that General Bradley and General Montgomery were coming right at him at high speed with 20 armored divisions, and Marshal Zhukov and the Russians were coming even faster from the east not knowing that his reign of terror, his tyranny was gonna come to a swift and terrible end at the business end of an M4 Sherman tank. But but here's what I can also see as well, and and I want you to see this. I can also imagine that one of those prisoners, they pick up one of these leaflets, and they read this news that a battle has been won in a forest or, or a beach not far away and, and that freedom and hope is imminent and, and quickly moving toward them. And yet, they also realize that there's still a prisoner in the camp. Same unimaginable fears that they had the day before they have today. Same hard life that they had the day before they They still have today, they're probably gonna have tomorrow. But here's what I really want you to see. Here's here's where I want you to, to, to see this. The thing about this leaflet though, the thing that's so unique about this leaflet though, is that it's not just that they have a future hope of glory. It's not just that their victory has already been purchased by blood that has been shed already and it will be soon made known to them because you see, just reading this leaflet, that's what gives them new wind in their sails. It gives her hope. So the same old fears, the same old drudgery that she had to face before, yeah, she's gonna have to face it again, but she does it with something different about her this time because she knows that somebody is coming for her and is soon gonna put her suffering to an end for good. And see friends, this is where this will really preach. Some of you are walking through unimaginable suffering right now. You're frustrated, you're tired, you're suffering. And we may find ourselves in suffering, but the good news of the gospel is that our victory has already been purchased and won by Jesus in his first coming. And this leaflet that we read, this promise of God that we read is that he's coming back a second time to finish the job. It is verse 27. The riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the fact that God has guaranteed our future glory because he has put the best part of glory inside us as a promise that he's coming back. So that reality means that, yeah, we're gonna wake up tomorrow and some of our friends are still gonna be in the hospital. They're still gonna be sick Our knees are still gonna hurt and and our kids are still not gonna listen because yeah, we suffer just like the rest of the world suffers. But we do not suffer as those without hope because we know that every moment of suffering in this world is producing an eternal weight of glory in us, preparing us for another day, an eternal day with him. And it's on the basis of hope in that day, in the glory of that day that enables us to continue on, to press on, not just with determination, not just with endurance, but with joy. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's gonna keep you going It's gonna help you actually endure. But there's a second thing that happens too when you understand who lives in you as a Christian. So let's just keep going the text. This is verse 28. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy. The Greek word for energy here is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. For this I toil, struggling with all his dynamite that he powerfully works within me. Here's what else is going to happen when you understand who it is that actually lives in you. 
you'll start living like Jesus works through you and supernatural power is real. You'll start living like Jesus actually works through you and supernatural power is real. Christians in here, honest question. Have you forgotten who lives in you? Yeah, you're involved in everything. You know, you're keeping everything afloat. You're pouring yourself out for everybody. You're pouring yourself out for your career. You're pouring yourself out for your family. But if you're honest with yourself, you're burning out a little bit. You feel like you're losing the endurance. You feel like you're losing the determination. Have you forgotten that as a Christian, the God who spoke the world into existence, the God who sustains it all, who holds it all together, he lives inside of you. I've heard this illustration many times. First time that I heard it though was in sixth grade Sunday school. My sixth grade Sunday school teacher was a former special ops commando. I think every sixth grade boy should have a former special ops commando as a Sunday school teacher. We walked in one day and John Smith said, boys, got a magic trick for you. I can make this glove pick up that pencil. And we're like, ooh, let's see what happens here. And he says, watch this, boys. Glove, you pick up that pencil. Nothing happened. And we're all looking in because this was like the coolest guy in the entire world. And as far as we were concerned, he can do anything. So we're just kind of seeing what's gonna happen. He said, all right, I'll try one more time. Glove, you pick up that pencil. And still nothing happened. So he says, all right, I'm gonna try one more time. He takes the glove, puts the glove on his hand. He says, glove, pick up the pencil. It's magic. To which Johnny Mertz is sitting right next to me and he says, that's not a magic trick. You put your hand in the glove. And without batting an eye, John Smith says, it is Christ working through you. It is just powerfully working through you, boys. See, it's, it's not about the glove. It's about the hand working powerfully through the glove. Because if Jesus actually lives in you and supernatural power is actually real, I'm telling you, that changes everything, y'all. Because you realize it's not about the glove, it's about the hand in the glove. So when you read a verse like verse 28 that says, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ, that sounds an awful lot like discipling somebody. And you're like, oh, I could never disciple someone. Oh, I, could, I could never do that. And of course you can't. You, you can't do anything. But Christ in you can. I don't know, have you read the Gospels? Jesus is a pretty good discipler. <laughs> and I'm just saying the logic of the text is that if he lives in you, you can be too because it's not about the glove. It's about the hand working powerfully through the glove. If that's the case, then ooh, you can pick up this bucket of, cup of Christ's afflictions here, all the blood and sweat and tears that you've poured into your life, all the ways that God has shaped you, all the ways that God has taught you, all the things that God has shown you and formed you into being the believer you are today. You can take that cup and you can go to the men's breakfast, you can go to the women's conference here, you can go to your life group and you can find someone who wants to be discipled. And you can walk up to someone and say, hey, I'm a little further along in my discipleship journey. Um, if you notice by my suffering cup here, I've had a lot of issues in my life. Um, God's taught me a lot of things. Would it be cool if I maybe came alongside you and, and kind of tell you a little bit about the, what the Lord's taught me? It's not about the hand, or it's not about the glove. It's about the hand in the glove. You see, if it's about the hand, if, it, if it's not about the glove, it's about the fact that Jesus actually works through you and supernatural power is real, then, then here's what can happen. You can, 
you can actually pick up one of these little promises of God that fell like a leaflet from the sky. And you can hold on tight to it. I'm telling you, this is the rabbit. This changes everything. And it's what's gonna give you the endurance. It's gonna give you the determination to continue with joy because all the blessings, all the access in the Christian life is through Christ in you. It's always under this doctrine. It's why, it's why the theologians often refer to this doctrine as the umbrella doctrine. Because everything in the Christian life is underneath this. Once you get this, once you get Christ in you, then friends, you get everything. That's why Calvin started off institutes like this. It's why he said we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless. But once Christ is in you, you get everything. So when I'm feeling guilty about a sin, when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling the weight of my guilt, when I'm feeling the weight of my shame, I could pick up one of those promises that says, in Christ I'm justified and no longer condemned, Romans 5.1. When I'm feeling lonely and anxious, I can pick up one of those promises that says I'm reconciled and no longer living in the far country, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. When I'm beset by a sin that I just can't kick, it just keeps coming at me, I can pick up one of these promises that says I'm no longer a slave to sin, Ephesians 1, 7. Friends, you are liberated, you are adopted, you are sealed, you are alive. And as Colossians told us just now, you have hope because Jesus is coming back and eternity is real. So let's just kind of get in the dirt here for a second. There's a lot of parents in, here, in this building right now. There's a lot of parents who are kind of walking through what it means to be you know, a parent of a young kid. I'm right there with you. I know it's hard. I know. I understand this. Like right now, me and Katie are, are talking through, like, do we put our kid in kindergarten? Do we wait for another year to put him in kindergarten? Do we do another year of pre-K? Oh, what, what's going on here? Why, why do we have, you know, how are we gonna bounce sports? How are we gonna, you know, do this in the fall? And oh my gosh, the tree house is on fire. Why is the tree house on fire? I don't, it's, I'm tired, I don't care. It's fine, it'll burn out, it'll be fine. Listen, you know the confidence that I get? You know how like, I, we get confidence to walk through this? It's because the God of the universe says that from the time I started talking this morning, we are 24 minutes closer to the reigning, ruling king of the universe, splitting the sky open and coming back to make all things new. Because in 100 years' time, Katie and I are gonna be around the throne worshiping the king of the universe, not as parents to our kids, but prayerfully as brothers and sisters in Christ of our kids. Those who have walked through miscarriages, you know, walking through infertility. We've been there, I know, it's hard, three times. No silver bullets, no magic words. But brother, sister, hear me on this. Christ in you means that miscarriages do not have the final word. Christ in you means that infertility does not have the final word. Some of you in here are having to watch a loved one suffer and you can't take it from them. You're having to watch them suffer and you're with them every step of the way. Some of you have gotten a call from the doctor recently and it wasn't a good call. Some of you are in the deep hole of depression. Some of you have been betrayed by a friend some of you have prodigals. You raised them in the church. You did your best. But right now, they're off in the far country. So many of you I know in here are suffering right now. I know. You ever been so tired? You ever been so worn out? That you feel like you're doing good just to crawl into a seat on Sunday morning and get a little bit of gospel medicine? Friends, here's the medicine. When you are weak, he is strong. 
When you feel like it's all meaningless, he says there's glory. When you feel like you can't do it, when you feel like you don't have the energy, he says that he is powerfully working within you. When you can't, he already did and continues to do. And we say, what an amazing, what a dynamite glove. No, what a dynamite savior. Friends, when you understand that it's Christ who lives in you, that all the power of God himself lives inside of you, that's when you have the endurance. That's when you have the determination to keep going with joy, even when life is hard. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, the one who is working powerfully within you. Listen, on a hot July morning like this, I'm not naive enough to think that there's some people in here who know that Jesus does not live inside of them. To where you would knock on the door of your heart and you know there's no God there. And you haven't seen the rabbit yet. Some of you may be like, man, that's just too crazy. Uh, You're actually telling me that the God who you say created the entire world, he wants to come and actually live in me? Yeah, man, no thanks. There's just, I don't believe that, no way. And and, and I would just simply say, yeah, I mean, it's a leap of faith, absolutely. And we've done a pretty good job in the past 300 years of pushing out the possibility of the supernatural in our world and in our life. But I want you to be honest with me about one thing, though. Everything we've talked about this morning, you want it to be true, don't you? The promise that God himself is coming back to renew and reconcile the world. That we're gonna live in a world with no more mourning, no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more evil. You want that to be true. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that what Christ has promised to do to reconcile and restore the entire world, he gives it as a possibility of a foretaste in reconciling and restoring you. We had a thunderstorm this morning. We haven't had one of those in a long time. There's something about a a Texas thunderstorm. In seminary, Katie and I lived in a high rise downtown. And I used to look out to the west and watch those dark clouds roll in. You could see them coming from miles and miles away. There's something about a thunderstorm in Dallas. Wind shifts a little bit. The air, the temperature drops a little bit. And you start to feel the cool mist on your face. All the while waiting for the downpour to come. Friends, that's what it means to be a Christian. It's experiencing the cool mist while waiting for the downpour to come. Jesus has promised that he is going to renew and reconcile the entire world. And in the meantime, we can be renewed and reconciled too. And all you have to do is ask. If that's something that you'd like to talk about, I'll be back there in the next step room and we'll talk about what that looks like. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we're grateful beyond words, beyond what we could even muster, that you have seen fit to miraculously, crazily live in us as Christians. Oh, Lord, that we as a church might understand what that looks like, we might understand what that feels like, and we might understand what that acts like Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your son. And even now we pray, O Lord, as he taught us to pray that your kingdom would come and it would come quickly. But not our will be done, only yours alone. In Jesus' name and by the spirit, amen. Love you guys. You are sent and Lord willing, we'll see you next week.